In this video, we're going to talk about Venko Ventures, trading under the ticker symbol BBIG. Before the video begins, just a quick heads up that not all my videos are made on the same day they're posted. If there are material events that happen afterwards, I will make a follow-up video to reflect those changes. With that being said, let's go to today's video. Vinco operates in the consumer products and digital marketing sector. Its most important asset is a social media platform for video streaming in the Indian market. It's definitely one of the more popular platforms, which is expected to fill the local demand in one of the largest markets in the world. It's both having a good narrative because of the video platform and because it is in the middle of a short squeeze between those who want to push it lower and those who want to squeeze out the short sellers. The trading volume of Vinco Ventures has recently been 64.9 million shares compared to an average volume of 56.4 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $1.95 and $12.49. The market cap of Vinco Ventures is currently at $435 million compared to an average volume compared to an enterprise value of $362 million. The difference between the market cap and its enterprise value is the premium or discount financial market is willing to allocate to the company based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. Some of the examples of impact by leverage is if the company has a lot of debt, then the market may feel uncertain about the company's capacity to pay back its interest and principles, which in turn may negatively impact its profitability, attractiveness, or even solvency. One key element to note regarding the enterprise value is that for many growth type companies, one of the most significant assets they own is the goodwill. Goodwill is basically an expectation of the market that the companies can generate more profit or to have more growth than other companies, partially because it has a good management, stronger brand recognition, bigger online following, and so on. It is basically what is unique about this company in particular compared to its competitors in the same sector. It's not a tangible asset that companies can use, but it's often the reason why companies are perceived to be trading at a discount because the market cap is lower than the enterprise value, which is the value that the market gives to its assets when the debts are paid off. In case the company goes to liquidation, goodwill would be completely depreciated and we will be left with potentially less assets to distribute to shareholders and bondholders than the figures shown on the balance sheet. In comparison to its historical price fluctuations, the stock is 47.7% higher than the one-month low, 47.7% higher than the three-month low, and 63.6% .6 higher than 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives a hint on the market sentiment on where the stock price is likely going to head toward, the implied volatility is 200%, compared to a historical volatility of 189%. The put-call volume ratio is currently at 0.61. It is normal for most stocks to tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve because many institutional investors choose to hedge their exposures by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 202,000 contracts within a day compared to the 30-day average of 152,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 1.2 million contracts compared to the 30-day average of 981.12 thousand contracts. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 13.6% of all its outstanding float. The biggest shareholders include Hudson Bay Capital Management, Bluefin, and Nomura. Understanding shareholder structure is relevant to an extent because it helps to determine if you should hold the stock long term or to view it as a short term volatility play. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, then it may be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long term trust from shareholders. Usually, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30 percent 
of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions, since many titles are mostly held by retail investors and non-institutional ones, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of the positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes when there are a significant short interest in the total volume, it can be a sign that there is an organized shorting operation going on, like what is going on with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 22.6% of the total float and 42.9% of the dark pool transactions. Now, let's also take a look at the indicators. Financial indicators give us a suggestion of what the price movements are showing, and they can be used as one of the elements to determine what should be our overall approach. Oscillators are showing 2 sell, 8 neutral, and 1 buy, with an overall tendency of neutral. The moving averages of the past price actions show 12 sell, 1 neutral, and 2 buy, the overall tendency being strong sell. Keep in mind that indicators often show what the present and the past performances are, but rarely predict with accuracy the future. Nevertheless, they can be used to determine if our timing of the trade is the right one. In terms of pivot points, which are levels of support and resistance sprinkled in the price trends, the support levels are $1.55, $2.15, and $2.27. For the resistance levels, they are $3.26, $3.55, and $4.04. Looking at the stock price of Vinco Ventures over the past few sessions and weeks, it seems like the share price initially went up before tumbling down once again at $3.20. The market participants are willing to believe that an eventual tide reversal of the the market participants are willing to believe in the eventual tide reversal at the end of the short squeeze. This is why we should never rule out the scenario despite the fact that right now things are not going in favor for those who are owning long the stock. Regarding the reason why the stock ended up going down, this may be mostly related to the number of people looking to get out because their cost basis has been relatively high. This is why I believe that we need to wait and see when the bulk of those sellers are going. This is why I believe that we need to wait and see when the bulk of those sellers are gone before expecting the stock to go higher, assuming that it still has enough steam by then to keep its positive momentum. My opinion on the company was bullish and, and is now between bullish and maybe just your watch list because it has now demonstrated that retail traders have not abandoned it, but the stock is still having a significant downward pressure. And this should always be factored in your position going forward. If the stock can manage to hold its line around $2.30 level, which has been a key support level for multiple times now, then there may be a chance for the stock to back up in the short and medium term. My recommendation is to make sure that your exposure on Venco is maximum 0.5 to 1% of your portfolio, and that right now it is better to wait and see whether the stock can stabilize itself around $2.30. Regarding the profit targets, other than the multifold potential, if the stock manages to push out the short sellers, I would say that the previous peaks over the past few months, between $5 and $10, is a good place to look for low-level profit targets as well. In this current market environment, I believe that we should be careful about taking positions and risk in the financial market in general, and in the equity market in particular. Because over the past decade or so, the financial market has been living with the help of newly created capital from QEs, resulting in a massive increase of asset prices and the corresponding decrease in their yields. And the low interest rate also contributed to reinforce this phenomenon because the financial sector would see its profit margins reduced and in turn keeps the returns of other sectors and employees low as well. At the same time, the market doesn't represent the real economy and the real economy doesn't get reflected 
in the price of different securities. The market is a game of supply and demand, which will depend on a number of factors, not just the fundamentals. If the asset prices only depend on the fundamentals, then their performances in the Northern Hemisphere would have been more than mediocre because things have been mostly stagnant over the years. A few things can explain why asset prices managed to remain high despite the stagnation of the underlying businesses. The first one is that over the years, there has been more money printed by different central banks to support their own economies. But because that money is distributed to banks and expected to loan to businesses to create more jobs, and that, in fact, there aren't that many opportunities out there, this money became capital that travels around the world and went into the huge financial melting pot. The QEs are now wrapping up in many countries, so I don't think that it'll remain as the main driving force over the next couple of years to keep the asset prices up. But it's compensated by the arrival of new capital from different regions to North America because it's perceived as a safe haven for investors. With the rising tensions around the world, this capital inflow will probably be sustained over the next couple of years, if not intensifying. The last phenomenon is the creation of artificial bubbles that are either supported by real market trends or completely fictional ones to allow market participants to play the game of hot potato and to either create profits or to safe keep their capital. The EV sector back in 2020 is an excellent example of this. But nevertheless, what it means for the market is that the degree of uncertainty is probably going to increase over the foreseeable future, as the expectation for a recession has been building up for more than a decade, and that the economic difficulties are accumulating around the world, especially from Asia. What this means for the market and for us is that the volatility is supposed to increase over time, which will provide opportunities to make a profit or to incur losses, depending on the timing and risk management. Another thing to note for this period of time is that we have to be very careful about having shorts. It's already riskier than having longs because the losses of shorts are not limited, right? Because there's no limit in terms of how far the stock can increase. But with the increased involvement of short sellers, I believe that the stocks been shorted will have an even higher probability of getting squeezed, which will result in potentially massive losses. So we're also like observing more of an irrational behavior from market participants in the sense that very often people will choose to rush in a position not necessarily because the fundamentals are convincing, but because there's a buildup of demand in a specific stock and people will pile in to ride the gravy train with the rest of us. That kind of behavior is highly risky and may result in losses. It's worth pointing out that in 2020 and probably in 2021, the market has never presented that many opportunities, but it was also during that same period of time that many retail traders have incurred their biggest losses. A rule of thumb is that each position should be structured so that even if they don't succeed, they don't impact the portfolio stability. Positions should begin small so that there is an opportunity to average down later. And specifically for the growth stocks, I think that 5 to 10% overall should be a healthy way for the portfolio. And each stock should represent about 1 to like 3% of the positions. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.